Well, everyone, thanks for coming to hear my presentation. I'm going to be talking about the uh, serverless map stack. Um, quick bit of background on myself here. So my name is Alex, I'm a geospatial software and application developer. Uh, also one of the founders of the Go Spatial organization. Uh, we largely focus on developing open source geospatial software using the uh, programming language Go. Uh, I'm also one of the core developers on Tegela, which is a Mapbox vector tile server written in Go. And you know, I kind of dig serverless. This new technology has been coming out. Well, I guess serverless, the concept isn't really new at this point, but um, still a lot of applications to be researched and you know, kind of explored. So, uh, how many people in here have used serverless technology like Lambda functions? And okay, it's about half the room. So, I'm going to give a quick background on what serverless is. So um, serverless computing, I found this good definition on the serverless stack. It says serverless computing is an execution model where the cloud provider is responsible for executing the piece of code by dynamically allocating the resources. Um, so really, when you're looking at serverless, like why do you care? Like what's really the big deal here? And the core concept is like, how do we scale easier and cheaper? Like how do we scale servers? I put quotes because it's all serverless, but yet there's still servers behind the scenes on it. Um, you know, databases now, we're talking about that, we're talking about scaling, you know, serverless databases, scaling the storage. Uh, and the whole intent is to shift your focus from, you know, DevOps, infrastructure management, and really get back to focusing on your application and adding value from that perspective. Uh, and then one of the big core themes of it is to only pay for the resources that you're using. So where serverless available? I mean, pretty much it's all the big providers at this point. You've got Amazon's got it, Google's got Cloud Functions, Azure. Uh, I think there's a whole bunch of different ones that are out there that are popping up. So you know, the, the concept and technology is becoming fairly prolific at this place. Um, as far as language support, all the providers are a little different on which languages they do support. Um, in the case of Lambda, they have a whole bunch of different languages you can see here. Uh, and I think Google Cloud Functions, they actually have a way to execute uh, Docker containers. I don't think it's like they call it cloud functions, but anyway, it's just trying to do like kind of serverless Docker executions as well. So, all right, so let's get into serverless vector maps. When you look at building um, a vector tile server, you kind of have these three core components that you need. You're going to need the tile server, uh, a tile cache, and a data provider. You don't necessarily need a tile cache, but usually it's a pretty good idea to put one in place here. Um, and you're gonna need, like I said, a data provider, which could be a whole bunch of different things. It could be, you know, post just a database, shape files, you know, different data sources here. As far as like serverless vector tile implementations, there's one that um, I've been working on, which is the uh, Lambda shim for Tegla. Uh, and, you know, it's written in Go, and all the geoprocessing and encoding has happened inside of Tegla. Uh, and it currently has support for PostGIS post and uh, GeoPackage. Uh, and then I was also looking around, just trying to find other implementations that are out there. And um, I actually came across this one that's fairly new by uh, Henry Thasler, and it's called Cloud Tile Server. Uh, and this one's been written in Node.js using TypeScript. And his strategy has been to take and uh, compile SQL queries uh, from a configuration file uh, and execute them against PostGIS. You're going to need PostGIS version 2.4. Uh, and you push all of the geoprocessing and coding down to PostGIS using the new STS MVT, you know, the simplification. So um, he's got it where he's pushing all the, the geoprocessing and coding down to the database server. Uh, and I'll say other tile servers could implement a shim and become serverless, you know, based on those different languages are there. You can usually implement some sort of shim um, to whatever the web uh, route the router is, and you can start making those various servers serverless. Okay, I'm going to talk about two primary architectures today. First one's going to be about using Lambda with Tegla, um, S3, and GeoPackage. And the next one's going to be very similar, but we're going to explore some of the uh, Amazon Aurora serverless Postgres. Before I get into this, I'm going to talk about the cold start. So the cold start's one of the big things you need to understand when you're looking at serverless. Uh, and it's really the time cost of instantiating a serverless resource. Um, everyone kind of focuses on the cold start because if your functions aren't being used or your resources aren't being used, uh, this is the initial time penalty that your user is going to encounter. So it's 
the cloud provider going, oh, we haven't used this for a while. Um, let's go ahead and dethaw this function and then make it available. And then it starts warming it up and it's ready for use. Um, and these things happen when um, a function hasn't been invoked for some time. Um, they don't always tell you like what this time period is, but say 10 minutes, it hasn't been used. It'll start being down to, you know, a, a cold function at that part. Um, also, if you're scaling concurrency. So if you look at a function um, that's being invoked lots of times, but then like there's a, a traffic spike. So uh, the concurrency needs to go up on it uh, as they start spinning up additional resources to handle this increased concurrency. Uh, you're going to be dealing with a cold start um, at that point as well. It won't be on the currently warm functions, just on the new functions that um, have been need to be dethawed and start executing. All right. So. Lambda, Tegla, S3, and Geo package. So here's a quick architectural diagram kind of explaining how this would work. I want to start with looking at the deployment.zip, that kind of dashed line through there. And what this is, is this would be what you would um, zip up um, as your Lambda function uh, package. So in this instance, we'd be using Tegla Lambda a Tegla configuration file, and you'd actually have the data provider geo package packaged up into this function payload as well. Now, if you look through the request context and how this is going to work, you'd have a request that comes in, you have API gateway, and you'd use a proxy routing inside of AP, API gateway to say just route all requests to the Lambda function. Then Tegla Lambda would take over, and it would start saying, okay, well, you know, what map are we looking at here? What ZXY tile are we trying to look up here? It's going to parse that configuration file to grab the various SQL statements that we want to execute. Um, and then it's going to form up a query and go and invoke geo package, pull the geometries out, uh, start doing the geo processing, apply the various encoding for MVT, and then it's going to stick a copy of it in the S3 tile cache and then send a response in. Now, if the tile was already in the cache, it would go ahead and fetch the tile from the S3 cache uh, so it doesn't have to go through and do all of the geo package, uh, you know, basically doing all the geo processing and encoding. Um, if you look at it too, there's a cold start time put up there, like around zero to two seconds on Lambda. Uh, so if your function is cold, you're going to buy about a two to zero to two second penalty. Um, it's relatively negligible overall. Uh, you're really going to spend more time on like the geo processing and encoding if it's going to be a fresh tile that hasn't been, it's not in the cache yet. All right, so the pros of this. Uh, I actually find this like a pretty clever, I really like this architecture. I mean, it's very self-contained. There's, there's really not much to it. Um, you put your package up, you put in Lambda, and you really just forget about it after that. I mean, it just starts running. Amazon's Lambda is gonna start you know, scaling horizontally. Uh, you don't really have to think a whole bunch. Um, there's also no virtual private cloud you really need to worry about from that perspective. Um, and the only cold start time you deal with is from Lambda. Um, cons. So there's a size restriction. It's probably the biggest one here is that um, it can be 50 megabytes zipped up your payload that you can put into Lambda. Uh, and Tegla is about 7.8 megabytes zipped, so that leaves about you know what 42 megabytes worth of data you can put in there zipped up, and so unzipped by 250. Uh, and currently, you know, Tegla only supports geo package with this approach. Uh, but additional data providers could be supported. It's positioned if someone wanted to write one for GeoJSON or shape files or whatever. So you could actually, you know, extend Tegla to support additional formats. Um, I think it's a really simple, elegant approach, and I think it would actually work in a lot of situations. Uh, also, depending on what your maps needs are, you could launch multiple um, of these instances. So you could have maybe one natural earth, and you could have maybe one that's more focused down on a city. So you can actually kind of break up your map and have multiple data providers and conflate on the client side too. All right, next one we're going to look at is going to be tying into um, Aurora serverless. So Serverless Aurora Postgres. This was officially re released you know, July 9th, 2019. So it's really new, uh, a couple months old really at this point. Uh, it's comes, it ships with Postgres 10.7 installed and it's also got Postgres 2.4. The really interesting thing about um, Aurora Postgres is that you can scale it down to zero. And the whole thing they're saying here is that you can scale this thing down to zero, shut the database entirely off, um, and then you can have it come back on from a cold start and then it'll handle all scaling. It tries to do like seamless scaling up in um, you know, the CPU, data storage, memory allotment, everything. It just tries to handle all of the scaling and everything for you. 
Um, when you scale down to zero, you're not paying for any compute time. You're only gonna be paying for storage at that point. Uh, and so it's a pretty interesting product from that perspective. You're like, okay, my database can now literally shut off when it's not being used. Uh, and then I have the availability zones that are here. So let's take a look at the architecture when using Aurora Serverless. Very similar, um, almost the exact same architecture as the Geo package. Um, come over to the deployment zip, kind of you can look at it. And the main difference is that we're not packaging Aurora Serverless, which makes sense here. Um, and so you just have the configuration file in Tegla Lambda. Um, I put this hard line in there for the VPC, for the virtual private cloud. Um, and then we point to Aurora Serverless here. So probably the big glaring things to look at here are your cold start times. Um, I mean, they kind of get pretty big through some of these resources here. And you know, when you start looking at 40 second cold start time, you start wondering, well, is this really feasible? Um, I wanna say this is an extreme scenario too, right? So this is like, you've set everything down to zero, you've had the database scale to zero, your Lambda function's cold. Um, when you look at the VPC side of things, that eight to 10 seconds right there is uh, about instantially instantiating an ENI, an elastic network interface. So you have to go from a Lambda function. If you go into a VPC, it has to set up these things called ENIs, which will be the bridge over into, uh, the, into the VPC, which allows you to access the database. So, that looks pretty rough when you start going, well, is this something I'd really want to use? Um, you can actually make some changes to the architecture uh, to get rid of those. And the way you would pull this off is if you got rid of the VPC and you went with using an IAM roles, you can restrict access to the Aurora um, serverless database from that perspective. Now, personally, I haven't really tried that yet, but that's what Amazon recommends. Um, and you know, I'm not too comfortable bringing my database outside of a VPC, but depending on your data set, depending on the application, it may make sense. Um, and then the way you get rid of the 30 to 40 second cold start time uh, on Aurora serverless would be well to don't scale it to zero. So if you just keep it at the minimum setting, um, they call them uh, Aurora compute units, I think ACUs. Um, if you wanna keep it on, it's gonna be, around $100 a month to just have it at that, basically it's a minimum setting at that point, but you'll get rid of that 30 to 40 second latency from the cold start time. All right, so a couple pros here. Um, handle scaling CPU, data store, connection count, and it can scale down to zero. You know, I hammered it just to see like what would happen from the connection count perspective to see just like, you know, just to throw everything at it. And I got it to scale up like 4,000 connections and it was just, growing really well. And then you just see the graph kind of scale back down as it wasn't being used all the way down to zero. So um, it's pretty interesting to watch. It handled scaling you know, better than I was expecting. Um, but then again, I didn't really know what to expect when using this. Um, cold startup times, like I said, can be 45 seconds plus. Uh, and most of that, as I described, can be mitigated if you were to launch it outside of a VPC um, and make sure that Aurora serverless was always on with at least the minimum settings. All right, so another way to look at improving our tile servers and the performance that we have here is to start bringing in um, a content delivery network. And this is really important, I think, especially if you want your maps to be like snappier, you start looking at the infrastructure we're talking here, we're talking a lot about like cold start times, um, and you really should start you know, moving the tiles and persisting them at you know, a content delivery network so you'll have edge delivery for them. Uh, and I've got two different models for this. So the first one, and this is the one that I've played with the most, was you put a, a content delivery network in front of your API gateway. So essentially a request comes in, you know, it goes to CloudFront, goes through the whole uh, invocation that we've been talking about today. Uh, but the downside of this is that when you have a, a miss on CloudFront, you're going to have to invoke API Gateway, which is gonna hit Lambda, and then you're gonna have that startup time. So let's say Aurora Serverless was cold and you'd scale down to zero, you know, um, just to come through this, even if you've got the tile, say, in Amazon S3, it's already been generated, you've got this startup time, which could be really expensive to get going there. Uh, but, you know, as if you have like a long TTL you set up on the content delivery network, uh, you'll be able to start persisting tiles more there, um, and you can kind of avoid having to go through the, the processing flow here as your tile cache starts filling up more and more. 
But I think there's a better way to do this. And actually, uh, I was talking with Henry, the, um, the guy who's been writing the other uh, Lambda implementation. Uh, Evan and I were talking this last week, and he had a different architecture, which I thought was a really good strategy. Uh, and essentially what he does is he says, hey, let's take CloudFront and let's go straight to our tile cache. And I was like, well, how's that going to work then if you have a miss? And what he'd implemented was uh, if you have a, a miss, so a 404 on S3, he does a 307 redirect to your API gateway. And you would only then invoke and have to go through the whole like cold start, boot up time and everything you know, um, that we've been talking about today if you've got a miss at your tile cache. And you know, I've actually been playing with this over the last several days, and I think it's, it's wonderful. I think it works really well. And so um, this, this just basically has the, the content delivery network writing right to S3. You go through the invocation, and then you know, as the tile cache starts filling up, you're actually utilizing the serverless technology less and less and less. And if you want to, say, update tiles, you can just purge areas from uh, your tile cache, and it'll go ahead and start invoking things again. All right, so when should we use these serverless map stacks, right? So I think they'd be really good for development and testing environments. And I think if you're gonna to scale to zero, I think it's perfectly applicable to do that in development and testing environments. Um, oftentimes the database is a very expensive part of the operation and you're not developing 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So shut them down if we're not using them. Um, you know, maps with intermittent traffic spikes. Maybe you're expecting huge spikes, you wanna warm things up, but you don't know how to scale them or how many resources. Um, you can actually, you know, use a lot of this infrastructure to scale for you. Um, tile seeding is another interesting application of using, say, Aurora serverless. Um, if you wanted to hit it really hard, you could, you know, have it scale up for you, and then it would scale down once you're done doing, you know, tile seeding. Um, you could also uh, maybe make, um, a script which would do massive parallelized tile seeding by hitting you know API gateway just to fill up your tile cache, um, and then also think maps with like you know high zoom requirements. So you may pre pre filled your cache with zoom zero to twelve, and then after that you want to have live um, tile generation um, directly from your data store. Um, and then some additional research I haven't been able to you know finish up yet is now. Um, uh, application load balancers can invoke um, function, the Lambda functions too. Um, and there's some pros and cons that could be developed from there. I haven't had the time to go through them all. Um, you know, API Gateway's got a max timeout of 29 seconds, which, you know, based on our cold start times here, you'll be getting timeouts in certain situations. Um, neither for API Gateway, as far as I know, it doesn't support HTTP2 when it hits the Lambda function. Um, application load balancer might, but again, I don't really know. Um, you can configure the load balancer timeout um, on application load balancers. And people oftentimes complain about the price of API Gateway, so application load balancer may be like a cheaper alternative. All right, so in the end, would I recommend this for production? I'm gonna say I'm not not recommending it. Um, so, you know, <laughs> I think you should tread lightly with it. I think that everything that I've, my research shows here, uh, it's pretty promising overall. I think you just need to understand like what the context of your situation is. I wouldn't say go out and just slam it into production, start in your development and testing environments. But overall, I've been pretty happy with the way this architecture is coming together. And if you can get things working that are, you know, to your satisfaction, the ops on this stuff is really low. So once it's configured, you really don't have a whole bunch of sub subsequent work to do. So, uh, but you know, here's some suggestions. Use the content delivery network. I really think that architecture looks great. I think it works really well, especially when you use it with obviously the tile cache. Um, precede some of the, you know, lower zooms, zero to 10. Um, I don't think scaling to zero makes a lot of sense if you're gonna try to put this into production, but you know, development, testing environments, please do, you know? And if you're brave, you can put the database outside of the VPC and use the IAM roles. Um, again, I haven't tried this yet. It is a suggested strategy, but you know, oftentimes when people are writing IAM roles, they just seem to use wild cards all over the place. So you need to have a pretty diligent IAM approach. So, um, all right, well, that's it. Questions? Again, my name is Alex. Um, just open up for discussion, so. Sorry, sorry. You, you first. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, 
Oh, really? When, when did they announce that? Hopefully that issue will go away. Yeah, that'd be amazing. So, wait, when did they announce that? Was that at their invent or reinvent or? Oh, really? Okay. And they're just going to handle it for you? It's going to be a no, non configuration? Wow. Okay. Well, that's great news. So we can remove that line from the, you know, still maintain their security, right? So, yeah. You can also move the line up. You can put every Lambda functions can be in your VPC as well. Oh, really? They're going to move them into the Lambda? So, but you'll still need a gateway, like uh, the load balancer API gateway. That's going to actually reach into uh, the VPC? Yeah. Yeah. So the Lambda functions now can be in your VPC. So um, that's what we do. So you don't have to do the VPC ex execution role is what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's definitely been that like VPC like bridge. People are like, you know, we're security, where are we handling it, performance, and so it's been back and forth. But it sounds like there's between what you're talking about executing inside the VPC, but also the ENI change, um, you know, that whole problem should be just going away. So, you know, and that's the other thing too, is you don't have to use Aurora serverless, obviously. You can use like just a normal RDS instance too, if you're you know more comfortable with that too. But you still have the cold starts we've been talking about. But it sounds like they're addressing them. So that'd be great. You can also use triggers. Instead of an HTTP re redirect, you can use a trigger from your S3 bucket to the gateway and to your Lambda function and then to a, a miss. You know, there's other yeah, exactly. And that's a good point. I mean, there's lots of different ways to architect it. This isn't the only like architecture out there. I mean, even from CloudFront, you can put um, uh, additional like Lambda at Edge triggers too. And so you can do some of like header redirects and re rewriting of um, the various, you know, content or cache control headers and stuff there too. So um, yeah, there's, there's plenty of these different architectures that are out there. Uh, it's always just a balancing act, like, you know, kind of where you at, what do you have, what's the performance goals of all those things. So. What's going on? We're seeing a lot more of uh, the newer solutions going to more as STS and MVT, as you mentioned, um, and using that along with particularly as increased performance in yeah, the just 3.0. Yep. I may do um, doing the geometry calculations. Um, do you see that becoming the de facto method? I mean, I think it'll it'll depend on you know what your data set is. So I mean, if you can get your data into PostGIS and that's what you're working with, then yeah, you know, I mean, if you you know are using geo packages, then no, I mean that won't work, right? So I think it just depends on you know kind of what you're working with from your data set. But yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff actually moving into using ST as MVT. You'll start looking at putting more pressure on your database that way too, which is, you know, so I think where, you know, Aurora Serverless would be great for that is that you can scale your database if you put a lot of pressure on it from that perspective, as opposed to um, horizontally scaling, say, web servers or the Lambda function for geoprocessing and encoding. Because you're basically putting all your pressure for encoding and processing on the database, right? Have you done any benchmarking of uh, Tegelo's uh, MVT creation against uh, STS MVT? Uh, nope, not yet. Yeah, and actually, um, Gotham's getting pretty close on um, the a big update to the core geo processing to it. So we'll be producing like way less point count um, in the resulting geometries, and actually handle some of the you know outstanding rendering errors that are there too. So I think at that point, it'll probably be a better time to kind of review it. So um, I've got the currently I'm running benchmark for Tegela for a uh, worldwide base map. Um, level complexity, yep. um, pre-rendering to Zoom 14. Okay, nice. And then I know that uh, T-Rex um, just recently released some of the benchmarks that they were doing too. I think you were, we were talking about that, yeah. I haven't, I haven't done much more than initial investigations into, into uh, T-Rex. Yeah, and there's like, you know, a lot of different options that are out there, um, you know, and, that's where I think that, um, you know, Henry's option too is like, I wanted to put a couple of them out there for serverless vector tile implementations. And so, you know, Tegla Lambda is obviously doing native geo processing and coding. Um, and then the cloud tile server is, you know, going down and using it at the database. So a couple different approaches you can go with here, so. So this is a lot more basic than we're talking about. Yep. 
Yeah, so I think this exact same architecture would work, um, you know, all the way through. So, I mean, it'd just be a different tile server. I haven't looked into, like, the raster tile servers and has anyone implemented, like, the Lambda shims. But, I mean, from an architectural perspective and implementation, um, you know, you're going to be able to do the exact same thing technically here. So I don't, I don't see, like, any reason you couldn't do it with raster tiles. It actually works well. Yeah. That's what we do. We use the one of your architectures like that for raster tiles. The cloud front CDN <laughs> is kind of critical to that. Yeah. So which one did you use closer to like to this one or? Yeah, this one right here. Yeah, for raster tiles. And which uh, tile server are you using? Well, um, Map Tiler. We um, have some some of our own products as well that we you know for our engines too. So did you so you use Map Tiler? Does it Map Tiler have a Lambda implementation, or did you put the shim in yourself? We've, yeah, we. Uh, I wouldn't call it serverless, <laughs> unless you consider Docker containers serverless. OK, yeah. Um, but yeah, you, know, you could write a whole one about you know, Docker containers instead of Lambda. Exactly, yeah. And um, you know, I was saying Google's got like a whole Docker um, side of things as well. And then, I mean, obviously ECS. I mean, there's a whole bunch of these different architectures. Um, actually, when I was writing this presentation, I, I had so many slides at first, and I just had to start like reducing the scope so it could actually be uh, one thought all the way through, because <laughs> there's so many things that are happening in this world. So. Uh, no, I think you should look at Lambda as pretty ephemeral. Um, I mean, Lambda, it can have a level of state. So you've got, basically, you can initialize things that are outside of the function call, and you can keep like a, a context inside of that. So um, really where that would be helpful, I think, is like a, a database connection pool, right? And so the subsequent time that that uh, function would be invoked, then you could have you know that same database that you've already built up, that connection, you don't have to reconnect. But I don't think you should look at it as really having much state inside of these things. They should be pretty much ephemeral when you're designing them, so. All right, any other questions? Anyone gonna go try this? <laughs> yeah. I think it's pretty fun technology, and like I said, I think it's, there's a, a lot of interesting opportunities here, and for me, the biggest one is like trying to spend less time on, on DevOps and really focus a lot more on the application development. But you know, with the cold start times, you just have to know you know what you're going to get hit with and kind of what you're juggling. So, um, but yeah, thank you everyone for for listening to me, hear me out, and uh, for the discussion. So.